Father God, we, uh, we want to know you deeper and deeper, more and more. God, that in everything that happens, that we would know your presence. That we would know that you are in control. And that our lifelong passion and goal would be to seek you. And that alone, Father. We thank you, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. What's good, everyone? Welcome back. Uh, happy Sunday. I hope you guys are um, doing well and had a great week. Uh, this week I have entitled the word, Our Prejudices Against God. Uh, let's see if I can, okay, there we go. Oh, all right. And the word comes from uh, Mark chapter 6, 1 through 13. So without any further ado, let me go ahead and read the passage for us if you'd follow along. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been giving, given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this a carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions, take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. All right, so uh, the key thought for the word today is God is better than you think. And the key verse will actually come later, so tune in uh, or hopefully uh, keep an uh, eye and an ear out for that. Um, I'm actually only going to be speaking on the first half of the passage, uh, just, you know, because they're kind of separate. Um, but I, I do feel like they do have some relations. I think one. A uh, key takeaway is that um, Jesus goes to his hometown, pretty much is rejected, but he's not really too affected by it. He's like, all right, well, it is what it is. I get it. And he moves right on. And to his own disciples, he gives them the same advice. If you go somewhere and they reject you guys or don't listen, shake the dust off your feet. Meaning it's like, you know what? We want no part to do with your uh, future. You've rejected the message of God to repent and to have faith. And uh, you know where that's going to take you, so we don't want even the dust from your town on our feet. That's how, you know, uh, you guys are, you know, on your own then. Um, and I think we can definitely take uh, some advice from that. And, you know, if we uh, experience rejection or people who are just uh, not for uh, the gospel, you know, we don't have to fret too much over it. We did our part. We share the message. We move on. We don't need to like get super down and depressed about it. So um, I'd like to share uh, the definition of a word that I know everyone is familiar with, but it, I think it helps to see the official definition, and that is the word prejudice, uh, which is this. It's an, an assumption or an opinion about someone simply based on that person's membership to a particular group. Um, you could expand that definition um, and it could be not only their membership to a group or just whatever it is that you may know about them. Um, you know, when we hear the word prejudice, I know most of us think that it's applicable um, for like us towards other people. Um, but have you ever considered that you may, you and I may be prejudiced against God? So uh, <laughs> the particular group that we put him in, I guess, is like divine beings or... Um, People who are not us. Um, so anyways, I just want you to keep that in mind. 
I'm going to give us a little synopsis of the past, the first half of the passage. First of all, Jesus goes to his hometown where he grew up. We're not talking about Capernaum, which is where he went to um, the seaside city after he was already an adult. We're talking about Nazareth, where he was, uh, you know, a, a kid growing up into adulthood. And what he does is he preaches in a synagogue. And that tells us something. Number one, you can't, not anyone can preach in a synagogue. Uh, while Jesus did actually not have any kind of rabbinical tr uh, training, um, meaning he didn't get picked up by a, uh, an official rabbi and go through all this like you know traditional training, um, but he was uh, trusted by the synagogue leaders um, enough to have the opportunity and the privilege to speak in the synagogue. And you know they wouldn't just let anyone speak there. And the Bible passage also shows us or tells us that he, it says he spoke with wisdom to the point that it amazed people. So his own words spoke for himself, and the fact that he was able to speak in the synagogue said a lot. It also said that they responded to his remarkable miracles. It may be that um, some of these hometown people of Jesus uh, saw him uh, in other towns performing these miracles because he went from village to village. Um, or it could have been uh, that they heard from firsthand witnesses like like their family members or their best friends or neighbors who says, hey, no, like me and like literally a thousand other people saw Jesus turn a little boy's lunch into like 12,000 people's worth of food. We, you can ask anyone. It actually, you know, happened. So that kind of thing. So they were either, um, you know, direct witnesses of or um, had known hundreds of people who all had the same testimony that Jesus conducted, performed these amazing miracles. Um, and their response is they took offense at him, meaning they were offended by the fact that this person that they considered to be a nobody was doing all these great things um, because he wasn't supposed to be a nobody. He's like, they're thinking you're supposed to be one of us. Um, and so what do they do? They call him a carpenter. And back then, um, a carpenter was not the most prestig prestigious work. Uh, you know, just like working in construction, you know, isn't, I personally, you know, don't have anything negative to say about it, but, you know, the general understanding is uh, not many of our parents say, you know what, I hope that one day you go to school and that you become a construction worker. You know, no, my parents are like, no, you uh, need to be a doctor <laughs> or a lawyer, you know, one of, one of the top three, or I forget, like some successful businessman, whatever makes a lot of money and gains a lot of respect in the community. Um, anyway, so they're like, yeah, he's just a carpenter. And the other thing they call him is the son of Mary. Some historical context, back then, everyone was actually referred to as the son of their father. That's how it worked. And it was no secret. Like, um, like you know, the movie Ben-Hur or uh, whatever. In, in Jewish culture, Ben means son of, um, just like Diaz in Spanish. Um, and so you would, you know, be son of Joseph or son of Sam or son of Daniel. So it would be the son of your father. But let's say you didn't have a father because your mom was, uh, you know, gave birth to you outside of a marriage um, or she was a prostitute or, uh, you know, you guys are unfortunate because your dad died. So it's a very derogatory way of referring to someone. And, you know, a lot of scholars think that because Jesus' father is never referred to that he must have passed away while Jesus was growing up. Um, and also, quite literally, uh, Jesus' father ha um, was not Jesus' biological father. It was God who was the father. And so there, are, there is some truth, but, you know, what people do, they take a little bit of truth and then they twist it into something that is meant to hurt the other person and make it derogatory. So these um, people who claim to know Jesus are really um, going the extra mile to bring him down, cut him down to size, and um, they're boxing him into this lowly position. They're like, who do you think you are? Um, and obviously the result is that there's no faith, no miracles happen. God, Jesus is not able to perform anything there. It says minus healing, laying his hands on a few sick people and healing them. Um, and the funny thing is there's, there's a lot of amazement going on. Um, the people are amazed that this 
nobody was, you know, teaching the synagogues and having such wisdom and power. They're like, wow, that's amazing. Uh, not in a positive way. And then Jesus is amazed at their uh, stubborn lack of faith. Um, and so the point is that we too, I think, we have our uh, prejudices against God. This passage, we can't just read it and be like, oh yeah, the prophet has no honor in his hometown, it's just the way it is. No, I think there's a deeper connection um, that, that uh, we can't just look down on the uh, Nazarene people and be like, man, how can they be so mean to Jesus? It's like, no, me and you can be like that too. Um, I'm sure many of us, uh, or some of the people that we know, have been to church, didn't like it. Uh, people were mean, unwelcoming, hypocritical. I know growing up, actually in high school, I hated church. I <laughs> went to mission, and people were hypocritical, but so was I, actually. Uh, we're all imperfect, but I hated church. It was too clicky. I didn't fit in, and um, I just didn't like it. And I, I remember... This is cringe, but I used to tell people why I didn't go to church because I just, you know, thought everyone at church was fake, blah, blah, blah. Um, we've heard sermons and we're just like, oh my gosh, so boring. And I'd rather be playing, you know, Valorant. Um, it's just sermons are for old people who, you know, like to listen to boring stuff. Or, you know, it's, it's, or on the other hand, it might be super interesting to listening to if you're listening to some like Pastor Furtick message where he's just jumping up and down and it's like, oh wow, that's inspiring for like two seconds and, and then what? Um, it's like, oh yeah, that's cool. It's a nice uh, eloquent speech. Um, or, man, but that's it. Um, or we read the Bible and it seems irrelevant, outdated, antiquated. And there's not seemingly much application for our lives and God's ways just doesn't seem very fun. Um, we've also had gung-ho parents who really, some of us have parents that really push us um, to like go to church and read the Bible and do all that stuff. And sometimes our parents don't do it in a nice way, in a loving way. And sometimes um, a lot of parents fail and they seem hypocritical. It's like, man, mom, if you pray so much, why are you yelling at me so much? If you trust God with all your heart, why are you forcing me to study so hard? Why don't you just trust God that my life turns out um, right? So we've had these less than positive experiences that for sure we know it's experiential um, and they're true things. But um, if we lead those thoughts to put God himself uh, and his truth in a box, we will, just like the people of Jesus' hometown, never be able to experience who God really is. And this will, as a result, stifle our growth limit or even kill uh, our faith and keep us from experiencing his goodness. So basically we have two choices. We can either choose to believe uh, that there is, there must be more to God um, and I'll open my heart to it or I will continue to shut God out because of my experiences and what I know has to be king. Like if I know something, nothing can trump that. Like that is the apex of all thoughts in the world. Um, and I used to think like that regarding church and God. And at some point in my life, I realized that that was really foolish. Like I was selling myself short just because I had met a few people at church that did not truly represent Jesus. Um, I was actually shutting Jesus out. And I then began to realize, wow, what a fool I am. And I decided to open my heart and say, you know what, God? And I experienced um, against my own will really uh it's not like i did anything right or tried but in in surrendering to my parents uh, ultimatum i went back to church and i experienced in, in, in just being present uh, god's grace and that melted my heart into giving him a chance and and that was to my uh that was to my benefit you know not god's um and so you know that's the fundamental pe uh, problem that you know people had from Jesus hometown that you and I have that we think we know that there we think we know that all there is to know about Jesus and that's simply not the truth um, and so today's word is for us to be able to get past our own thoughts um, and you know that's where pride comes in you think you know everything you think that what you know must be everything and that whatever you know has to be right and you could never be wrong and we have this distorted uh, lens through which we view reality called pride. And the truth is that whatever 
or whoever we think God is, there's bound to be somewhere, something in your thinking that is actually not true of God. Um, so what are some things that you may think um, is part of your understanding of God that might not actually be true? How do you even know this? Well, unless you're just completely blinded by pride or hurt or something, like usually there's like this tugging on your heart. Um, like, yeah, I know, I know it's not true, but bad, whatever. Um, personally, the hardest thing that I've had, uh, the hardest time that I've had in differentiating um, or just understanding God right was differentiating between my dad and my heavenly dad. Um, and how I feel about God was oftentimes uh, informed by <laughs> how I feel uh, with my own dad. Um, and, and, you know, my dad is scary and <laughs> growing up, not now, but not growing up, you know, not that loving, short tempered, um, impatient at times, uh, sometimes kind of emotional and maybe even unstable at times, just super angry um, and disappointed and angry at my failures constantly. Um, maybe that's like most Korean dads. Yeah. Um, but is that what God really is like? And we know, you know, we, we read the Bible and um, it says that God is good, but really, when you think about it, the the, the per, pervading thoughts in our hearts, oftentimes it's littered with little things that are not true about God. Um, and so, what if God says, you know what, you know, I, I'm brother, or sister, son, or daughter. I'm really, uh, God says, I'm really not like that. I am like this. Will we then, at, as a response to His word? take him at his word and follow in it so that through living in his ways that we will experience how gentle and kind and loving God really is. Maybe for someone else, uh, you know, switching gears here, maybe someone else, uh, with them, their problem is not that, but it's like that just God's not fun. Uh, that he's really just boring. It's for boring people who like following rules. Um, and that being holy and set apart is the opposite of, a, of an exciting life. Like, you're just constantly like, oh man, you know, FOMO. Like, you know, I, I want to go out there and party. I want to I wanna do what I want to do and you know, make a ton of money and just, you know, like, you know, go on, you know, lavish trips and go crazy. And, you know, that's what's really what life is about. And doing things God ways is, is boring. Have you ever considered that that way of thinking is flawed? And that that immediately puts God in a box. Um, and therefore, you're selling yourself short. Um, and therefore, you miss out on what his, the, the, the vast, uh, what, the enormities of what his promises are, his blessings, uh, his truths, um, even his warnings. Um, last night at Friday service, uh, we were studying the life of Lot. And how he, um, he was like the opposite of Abraham. He went his own way and did his own thing. Settled near Sodom and ended up in Sodom as a leader. And then he ended up on the mountainside with his two pregnant daughters by him, uh, who were, became impregnated by him. Um, his wife is gone. His, his two future son-in-laws are gone. And everything, his home, everything is gone. Um, and even his mentality, his way of thinking is so distorted and sick um, that... You know, it's like, wow, how does someone even become like that where the townspeople want to rape the angels and he decides, you know what, have my virgin daughters who are betrothed to get married. You just rape them instead. Like, what kind of person says that? And that's what Lot became. And he wasn't always like that. He used to be with Abraham, his spiritual guidance, his uncle. Um, and so we put God in a box and we live our lives the way we want to. Uh, you know, look at what happens. Um, see what happens and my message to you is don't <laughs> don't see what happens uh, when you you know go off the evil path and and what the what the enemy wants you to think stay in God's line um, you know, there's a story about the old man and his son uh, they don't have a good relationship and the dad is just like you know what the son left my uh, left my household and he's just a bad guy and there's nothing good that can come out of him I give up on him and, and then one day his son sends him a package and his son has changed and he felt so bad that he just sent his dad this box of, of money 
um, and so the dad he refuses to believe anything about his son. That, oh, they, there's no way he'd change. There's no way he would do such a thing. And so he never opens the box, and he just uses it as a door, um, as a door stopper, uh, for the rest of his life. And he dies without ever opening the box and seeing the money in it. How sad is that? And you know, you put something in a box, you, you, you limit something, and you assume that you know what is true about it, yet you don't really know. Um, so I'm going to move on to our key verse today, Psalm 34, 8. It says this, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in Him. And I just wanted to unpack something real quick. Take refuge comes from the Hebrew word chesa, which means to have hope, to put your trust, to find protection in um, and that which we do in God. Notice that the verse doesn't say, trust me, God is good. And blessed is the one who might put their faith in God. No, it says, taste and see. And you know, know for yourself how good God is. Um, blessed is the one who actually takes refuge in him. But it's just like people who, you know, don't eat certain foods. Like, man, I'm, I'm not going to try that. I already know that it's not good. I'm never going to try that. And it's like, but you haven't even tried it. How do you know? Um, uh, so my encouragement to us again today is to try God and let God be God. Don't put him in a box. Our finite thoughts and our unwarranted uh, prejudices, or maybe they are warranted, but our limiting prejudices cannot truly see God and let him be who he is um, to us. And just like the people of Jesus' hometown who heard Jesus' speaking, they saw his ability to perform remarkable miracles. And, you know, if they saw him grow up in Nazareth, they would have seen his demeanor and the way in which he grew up as a perfect child who never did anything wrong. I mean, how could you blame a kid um, when he's perfect? He's a good boy as an adolescent. And as he grew up, I'm sure he, you know, was a great member of the community. And yet because of their own prejudices, because of their own thoughts, which they were just like, my thoughts are right. No one else can <laughs> is right besides me. It blinded them and they couldn't even see his power being displayed right before their eyes. Um, so if you haven't experienced God um, and you therefore write him off as X, Y, Z, my encouragement again to you is to give him a chance. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Experience the blessedness that comes from putting your hope in him. Um, that's the word for this week. Uh, I hope you're encouraged. I hope you actually try God out and let that begin to grow your faith in him because God is truly good and don't let yourself be um, overcome with assumptions or sell yourself short based on other people's representation of God. Let God represent himself. Uh, let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you for this message. We know that a lot of uh, people have been hurt by the church. A lot of us have been hurt by people in general. Um, and uh, being that the church is uh, you represented by your people, uh, there's, there's a lot of hardships. And I know the enemy can use this to stifle faith or um, stop faith from ever growing. And uh, Father, I pray, Lord, um, that whoever is hearing this message would be encouraged to try you out, Father, to taste and see that you are good truly with their life, Lord, and that in, in, in that endeavor, Lord, that your grace would just um, fill every nook and cranny, that your grace would begin to uh, melt the ice of assumptions, uh, to, to wash away uh, the pain and the hurts that, that fortify our prejudices against you, Father, um, and to, by your grace and mercy, to forgive us of our pride and our uh, unwillingness to step down from the platform of what we think we know, and just to say, God, please be you in my life. Let me truly experience the, the greatness of who you are and how exciting it is, how life-giving, how truly joyful and how uh, fulfilling and um, purposeful it is to be set apart for you. Um, God, we thank you, Lord, uh, for your patience with us, for your love. Um, may you be praised and may your name be glorified. We thank you and we pray this in your name. Amen. All right, guys. Well, I hope you have a great and victorious week. I'll catch you next time. Much love. Bye-bye.